Good morning, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to join the conference today. My name is Falud Kaboub, and I teach economics at Denison University in the United States. And I'm also the president of the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity. It's a, a great honor to join uh, the conference today with the theme of economic sovereignty, uh, political sovereignty, and focus on issues of African sovereignty in general. Uh, it's uh, super exciting to be part of this event, especially that it coincides with the launch of CORA, which is the Collective for the Renewal uh, of Africa, which is a coalition of more than 100 uh, African scholars and public intellectuals who are also debating and engaging in conversations about decolonizing the African continent in terms of economic colonization, in terms of educational, scientific, cultural colonization. Uh, so it's uh, extremely important for your association, uh, the Association of Pan-African Journalists, to be hosting this event and engaging in these conversations. So today I want to talk to you about the importance of monetary sovereignty as a critical component of economic sovereignty, as a critical component of sovereignty overall. So what is the concept of monetary sovereignty? The idea here comes from uh, a school of thought in the economics profession that many of you have probably heard of in the last few years called modern monetary theory. And I'll share with you a few resources here for those of you who are interested. This book by Randall Ray, called Modern Money Theory is a great resource and the best-selling book on the New York Times uh, list is The Deficit Myth by Stephanie Kelton, highly recommended, very accessible uh, book. In terms of uh, specific um, issues related to the African continent, I highly recommend this book, uh, Africa's Last Colonial Currency, the CFA Frank Story, uh, by my colleague Ndongo Sambasila, a Senegalese economist, and Fanny P uh, Pijot, uh, a French journalist. The same book is also available in French, the original version, L'Arme Invisible de la France Afrique, a uh, very important book, focused on the CFA franc area, but highlights many of the structural issues that we deal with in the African continent. So, I'd like you to think of the concept of monetary sovereignty on a spectrum. So you have countries with very high degrees of monetary sovereignty, countries like the US, the UK, Japan, Canada, and so on. And on the opposite extreme end of the spectrum, countries with limited or even no monetary sovereignty whatsoever. And those would be countries, for example, that completely gave up their national currency and use a foreign currency. Ecuador, for example, would be a, an example of a country that gave up its national currency and uses a foreign currency altogether. The CFA franc zone would be a region with very limited degree of monetary sovereignty. So the argument here is we want to establish the right set of economic policies that allow us to acquire higher and higher degrees of monetary sovereignty, which would give our countries more resilience and more independence, economic and political independence. So the factors that weaken a country's degree of monetary sovereignty are essentially related to external debt. And by external debt, I mean debt denominated in foreign currencies. That is when a country is borrowing and promising to pay back in dollars or euros or British pounds and so on. So the larger the amount of external debt a country has, the weaker its uh, degree of monetary sovereignty is going to be. So if you look at a country like the US, like Japan, the entire debt stock of the United States is denominated in US dollars, not in foreign currencies. The entire debt stock of Japan is denominated in Japanese yen. Japan has the highest level of debt to GDP ratio. 266% at this point, but it's all denominated in Japanese yen, Japanese yen that the Japanese government can issue into existence to honor its commitments in terms of debt commitments. So that's a critical component. So to identify why certain countries, especially African countries and countries in the global south in general, why they're forced structurally to accumulate a massive amount of external debt, it has to do 
with structural trade deficits. That is to say that we typically import more than what we export, despite all kinds of efforts to industrialize, to attract tourism, to attract foreign direct investment. There are structural traps that I'd like to highlight today that demonstrate why we're trapped into this mode of economic um, uh, subjugation uh, at the international level. So the root causes of the external debt are the trade deficit. But when you look carefully what the trade deficit actually represents, you'll find three structural areas that are typically present in the African continent and the global south in general. Number one, the lack of food sovereignty, the lack of food security. That is one of the major causes. Number two, the lack of energy security, energy sovereignty is a key structural problem. And that is even true for the biggest oil exporters. Why? Because the biggest oil exporters, they actually export crude oil, which is a useless material after all, you can't really use it uh, in industrial production or, or even for transportation. What you do is you, imp you export the crude oil, the raw material, and then you re-import the refined version of crude oil in the form of gasoline and kerosene and petrochemicals for industrial production, which means you export the low value added version and you import the high value added version. And that is a structural trap. So you have lack of food security, lack of energy security. And number three, which is the most important problem is the type of industrialization that most countries in Africa and the global south have specialized in is industrialization that focuses on low value added manufacturing. In other words, we import capital, we import the intermediate goods, we import the components, and we use low cost labor, we race to the bottom competing for the lowest cost of labor, the lowest labor standards, environmental standards, the lowest taxes, the most advantages to foreign investors and exporters in order to create assembly line type of factories to assemble the components that we imported from abroad. So we import the high value added content and then we export low value added products. And once you're trapped into this type of industrialization, it doesn't matter how fast you try to accelerate your exports, how fast you try to increase the level of uh, production, as long as it's focused on low value added content of manufacturing and extractive industries, you're always going to be trapped in that vicious cycle. So you have these stru three structural problems, lack of food, food security, energy security, and low value added industrialization creates a structural trade deficit. That trade deficit lowers the value of your currency relative to the dollar, relative to the euro. So now you have a trade deficit. It leads to weaker currency or currency depreciation, which means the next morning a country is trying to import food or medicine or gasoline for its people. It has to import it now with the weaker currency, which means you're importing inflation. And that is very destabilizing for any country because you're literally going to observe immediately potential for food riots, for protests because people can't afford food, can't afford transportation, can't afford medical services because of this inflation pass-through effect. So in order to insulate the most vulnerable people from this inflation risk, most developing countries, their central bank or ministry of finance will step in and artificially fix the exchange rate at a artificially high level in order to import items at reasonable prices in order to stop this inflation pass through effect. And the way to fix the exchange rate is essentially done via the accumulation of more external debt, debt denominated in dollars and euros and foreign currencies. So that's what creates the structural trap. And then we're looking at long term solutions that have been proposed by the mainstream of the economics profession, by the World Bank, by the IMF, we're told in order to fix this problem and pay off the external debt, we need to somehow earn more dollars through exports, through tourism, through foreign direct investment, through the liberalization of financial markets to attract foreign investors, 
or via remittances by exporting our own people to Europe, to the United States and Australia and other parts of the world so that they send money back home. That's what we call, what we call remittances. So you have these five factors, exports, tourism, foreign direct investment, uh, remittances, and liberalization of financial markets. These are the typical solutions. I'll go through these five solutions and demonstrate that these are structural traps, that the only way out of these traps has to do with the structural sources of the external debt, which is food, uh, lack of food sovereignty, lack of energy sovereignty, and low value added industrialization. The only way out is to invest in food security in food sovereignty, and especially sustainable agriculture. Number two, to invest in renewable domestic energy production in order to acquire energy sovereignty. You can't run an economy without food. You can't run an economy without energy. These are the basic components of resilience. And number three, we have to, over time, acquire the skills and research and development, technical skills and education in order to move up the ladder, so to speak, and start producing higher and higher value added content and become more selective in the types of industries that we specialize in. And that requires long term strategic investment in education, technical training, uh, public health and infrastructure and so on. Those are the long term solutions that will allow us to to acquire higher and higher degrees of economic sovereignty, monetary sovereignty, and as a result, political sovereignty. So let me walk you through the traps that we're constantly uh, trapped into this, uh, this quagmire. Tourism, for example. Yes, you bring millions of tourists, they bring dollars and euros with them to pay for the hotels and entertainment and so on. But when you bring millions of tourists, you have to feed them, which means you import more food and you have to transport them, heat and cool the hotels for them, which means you import more energy. That's why it's a trap. You're not the only country attracting tourism, you're competing with a hundred and some other countries as well. And we're all racing to the bottom, trying to do the same thing. Number two, exports. Number three, foreign direct investment. All of these manufacturing based type of solutions, if they're specialized in low value added content, then we're constantly going to be in that trap. The only way out is to start to specialize in higher value added content, which means you have to have the technical skills, the infrastructure uh, in order to attract higher levels of uh, value added uh, uh, type of manufacturing and move away from the extractive industries from the assembly line type of manufacturing. Um, number three, remittances is a dangerous thing in the long term because you're literally investing millions and millions of dollars to educate young people, produce a healthy uh, youth population, and then ship them abroad as a gift to other nations in Europe and the United States and Australia uh, for the sake of sending a little bit of remittances. This is brain drain. We're sending the best and the brightest. Those engineers and doctors and technicians and IT specialists that we need domestically to build a more resilient and more prosperous economy. So it's not a sustainable solution to rely on remittances. Um, and finally, relying on liberalization of financial markets in order to attract foreign capital, it's a trap because you're doing it in an artificial manner that essentially forces us to lower taxes, lower regulations, artificially create higher rates of returns by raising interest rates. And when you do that, you're essentially attracting speculators primarily. So these are the structural traps that we need to be aware of. And as a result, our economic policy solutions must move away from these traps and focus on food security, energy security, and long-term strategic vision for industrialization that focuses primarily on higher value added content of manufacturing. And with that, I'd like to invite all of you uh, to join us and engage with us. There's, uh, there are many economists, political scientists, uh, public intellectuals involved in CORA, the Collective for the Renewal of Africa, who are pushing for this long-term strategic vision so that we know where we're going and we focus on escaping from these structural traps and creating a new path towards resilience, towards prosperity 
for the African continent and for the global south in general. And with that, I'd like to thank you again for the invitation and I'm happy to engage and answer any questions if you uh, would like to reach me via email or on social media. Thank you again.